Well, good morning. If you've been at Grace Bible Church for any amount of time, you know that this is the part of the service where we're going to take a piece of bread representing Jesus's body, and we're going to take a cup of juice representing Jesus's innocent blood spilt on behalf of sinners who would trust in him. So as a church body, almost every week we follow Jesus' instructions by taking the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. We can't ever think too much about the wonder proclaimed in the good news that is represented so succinctly, so tangibly in the Lord's Supper. The eternal, perfect, holy, all-powerful God who created and sustains all things. Think on this. He took human flesh, skins, skin, bones, blood pumping through his veins. Creator become creature. Perfect God in Jesus became man so that he could righteously reconcile sinful man to holy God through his substitutionary death. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Each of us was born naturally at enmity with God. We have, all of us, sinned willfully, wholeheartedly, and repeatedly against him since we were born. God would be justified to relate to us with wrath In fact, his justice demands it. But Jesus died in the place of all who had put their faith in him. Romans 5.10 says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. This is why Jesus came to earth and took on flesh and blood that we remember at the Lord's Supper. To die, to give his life as a ransom to offer forgiveness of sin, justification, righteousness before God. The gap, when you consider just how big this gap between my sin and a holy God is, this becomes all the more wonderful, all the more amazing. That gap is infinitely great. Sinning less or doing more good works cannot move me any closer or further from God. That's because the gap is infinite. The worst sinner in the eyes of the world and the best of us are still infinitely separated from God because of our sin. We're infinitely far apart from God, apart from the salvation that he, only he offers through faith in Jesus. Nothing that we can do, hear this, nothing that we can do can make that infinite holiness gap any smaller. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone. It is not of works, so that no man can boast. Just like you were justified by grace through faith, you will only be, I can only be matured and sanctified. How? By grace, through faith. Obedience is non-negotiable for the Christian. But we must never act like we can merit God's favor or earn righteousness through what we do or by keeping rules. This is called legalism, and it is as anti-gospel as you can get. Open your Bibles to Galatians 2.21. If you don't have a Bible, can you raise your hand? We have some men who will give you one. Galatians 2.21. If you don't have a Bible, this can be yours to keep. If I were to ask, who here is a legalist? I bet nobody's going to say me. I'm a legalist. Especially after I say that's as anti-gospel as you can get. But I must confess that I see temptation in my own heart to act like one sometimes. You might too. 
And I hope that our time in God's word prepares you to think of the cross rightly and put to death any legalistic tendencies in your thinking, especially in the way that you would approach the Lord's table. In Galatians 2.21, Paul is finishing his admonition to the apostle Peter, of all people. He started that in verse 14. Peter had begun to act out of step with the truth of the gospel, when he began to act like keeping Jewish dietary laws or being circumcised was required, or at least somehow meritorious for being acceptable before God and worthy of his fellowship. Some in the Galatian church, and even Peter, were adding a requirement for acceptability in addition to faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Nobody was straight up denying Jesus' importance. But they just felt better about themselves before God if they could point to their law keeping as important and maybe making distinctions among themselves. Galatians 2.21 says, this is Paul speaking, he says, I, I, for my part, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Paul accuses Peter and the Galatians in their legalism of nullifying the grace of God. Why? Because if righteousness were through the law or any, any adherence to a standard, then Christ died for no purpose. If we act like any finite work can bridge that infinite gap that could only be bridged by the death of the Son of God, we essentially declare that salvation by works is somehow possible. And if that is so, then Jesus died for no purpose. As Christians, to boast in or to feel confident in anything other than the cross is to declare that we have added to our salvation. In so doing, we detract from and ultimately are in danger of nullifying, or at least attempting to nullify, the necessity of Jesus' death for our salvation. You see how legalism is as anti-gospel as you can get? Peter and the Galatians should have known better. Peter was looking on when Jesus was actually hanging there at the cross, and the Galatians had clearly heard and understood Paul's teaching of the crucified Messiah. And we remember Jesus' death in the Lord's Supper each week. So Paul responds to this hypocrisy, Galatians 3.1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified when they heard the preaching of the gospel. So why am I bringing this up? Well, I wonder if you and I might be more like Peter and the Galatians than we often recognize. Perhaps we might be in danger of smuggling merit even into this remembrance of the Lord's Supper. Not overtly. I don't think we'd write that in our doctrinal statement. The Catholic Church is pretty forthright about their legalism at the Lord's Supper. They act as if righteousness might be imparted to the recipient through eating and drinking. That's heresy, and that is nullification of grace. But we're remembering and proclaiming Jesus' death and our salvation, Jesus' death and our salvation by grace through faith when we eat and drink. We are not performing an act that imparts righteousness. Right? There can be no such act, otherwise Christ wouldn't have had to die. But what goes through your mind each week when the bread and juice comes? Maybe you've had a good week quote-unquote, generally marked by obedience, diligent Bible reading, a better-than-normal manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, praise God. But you must consciously and explicitly declare now as you take the bread and juice that those works do not add one bit to your salvation or worthiness of God's grace. Those works should not be the basis of your comfort, of your confidence as you partake. If you've done well this week and you are therefore less prone to be in awe 
less thankful, more comfortable, you may have actually smuggled merit to the Lord's table. You might be trusting even just a little bit in your works. If you do, you're in danger of trying to nullify the grace of God, acting as if Jesus didn't have to die, as if you have something to bring. May that never be. Remember and proclaim Christ rightly this morning when you take the bread and the juice. What about the flip side? Perhaps you've had a week or a morning or maybe going on longer than a week where your sinfulness was more evident than usual. You do have faith in Christ, but you're overwhelmed by the manifestations of sin that continue to pop up in your life. Maybe the thought has crossed your mind, how could I take the Lord's Supper today after I just sinned like that? You are right to consider your sin and confess it. You must. And when you do so, Jesus, God promises that he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But your sin should make you recognize your complete dependence on God's grace for justification and sanctification. Your sin, whether it's a good or a bad week, should lead you, Hebrews 12, 14, to pursue by faith holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But it must not detract in your confidence in the completed work of Jesus on, at the cross. So if you've had a thought that maybe I should just let the bread and juice pass and wait until I've been more consistent, then you might actually be revealing yourself to be a legalist. Add that way of thinking to the sins that you confess. And then with faith in Christ's grace alone for salvation, take the bread and juice in confidence if you are saved. This is not a confidence based on your obedience. It's a confidence that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient to forgive you, sanctify you, and bring you safe to glory. And then in the shadow of the cross, pursue wholehearted obedience, not to earn salvation, but as an outworking of it. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're relying in any way on being good enough to stand before a holy God, or if you've just given in wholeheartedly to sin, let the bread and juice pass when it comes. This remembrance can only be for those who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But please don't leave here today without speaking to me or someone else about this incredible good news. If you are a Christian, take the bread and juice when it comes in remembrance of Jesus and as a proclamation of his all-sufficient sacrifice on your behalf. Men, please serve us. And then, Christian, take communion on your own as your heart is prepared.